Good morning, everybody. Welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Thank, thank you for coming. Uh, it's going to be a fun, fun morning, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS. Uh, a little bit uh, uh, enfeebled right now because I'm coming back from something, but I wanted to be here with you, uh, and I certainly wanted to be here to listen to Admiral Moran. This is an opportunity for us. Uh, and let me just say in, in advance, uh, Admiral Moran, of course, as you all know, has been nominated to be the next CNO. You'll have to be respectful in your questions. He can't answer everything. He's in an environment where we're not going to get him in trouble, right? We want him confirmed. We're not. We're going to be the last ones that are going to make this awkward for him. So, if he chooses not to answer a question, just just accept that's 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 for all of us because we want him to be confirmed. Uh, but when we have uh, outside groups, we always start with a little safety announcement. You may hear, we've never had it happen here, but we're responsible for you. So uh, if we do hear an announcement, we're going to go through this door right over here. It'll take us down uh, to the ground level. We'll take two left-hand turns and a right. We'll go over to National Geographic. They have a fabulous exhibit right now on <laughs> <laughs> about the queens of Egypt. And if we have to go there, I'll pay for everybody's ticket. You can watch it. If we don't have an emergency and you go to the show, you pay for your own ticket, OK? Uh, we're, we're very lucky uh, today to have Admiral Moran. It's a pivotal time you know, for the country. We've got. Uh, uncertainty about uh, the challenges throughout the world. Uh, one absolute rock bottom certainty is that we're going to have the Navy that's going to be out there that's going to be reassuring our allies, our friends, and us about the constancy of America's will to ensure that there is a safe and peaceful environment free of intimidation. It's so you can count on that, and I know that's going to be a commitment that Admiral Moran is going to carry with the Navy going forward. But for the formal introduction, let me turn to Pete Lyons. He's, we're a great partnership. We've, Pete, we've always been grateful to have this opportunity with the Navy. So please come up here. Welcome, Pete, with your warm applause so we can get this started. Thanks. I'm not going to make a big introduction because I, I think that most of our audience is aware of his body of work. And uh, so I just would like to say that it's been a big week uh, for Admiral Moran and for the Navy. Congratulations. And as Dr. Hamry alluded, uh, there's a confirmation hearing uh, coming up. And out of respect for that, I'm not going to ask the vice chief to get ahead of his skis. Uh, he won't be able to talk about what might happen or could happen if he's fortunate enough to be confirmed. And so our conversation will focus on what's happening now and his duties and responsibilities today. And uh, I think that gives us plenty to talk about and uh, ask that the questions focus the same way. Um, so before we get to questions, uh, we'll start with a few icebreakers here. But uh, again, thank you, Admiral, because you could have easily uh, postponed this. This was scheduled long before your nomination was announced. And uh, so thank you for uh, being here today with our audience. Um, also, just like to acknowledge briefly that our sponsor for the Maritime Security Dialogue for 2019 is Huntington Ingalls Industries, and we very much appreciate their support. So just an easy icebreaker question. Uh, the Navy stood up the, the Readiness Reform Oversight Committee in February of 2018 to oversee all the implementation and corrections that have to do with the um, McCain and Fitzgerald follow-on actions. That, comprehensive review recommendations, the strategic review recommendations. And now here we are uh, well on in that process. And just wanted to ask you if you know, you're one of the leaders of this process, the leader of the ROC, um, where do you think we stand? And uh, how does it, uh, what has it taught us? And maybe as a follow on, is there, are there lessons here beyond just the surface community? Yeah, well, first of all, Dr. Hamry, if he left already, He's over here. where are you, Dr. Hamry? Uh, sir, thank you for being here today. It, it was an honor to, to learn that you were going to be here, and I, I greatly appreciate it. Your, your wisdom and your mentorship over the years has meant an awful lot to me, so thank you. And Pete, thanks for, thanks for having, uh, having me here. Uh, we did commit to this three months ago. I wasn't quite prepared for 
uh, last Thursday, someone asked me, well, what's it feel like? I said, well, it's the uh, first day of the Masters. I've, I'm, <laughs> on the first, I'm on the first tee, and somebody just announced me to tee off, and I'm looking down the fairway on either side, and there's thousands of people. Well, maybe not for me, but my playing partner, Tiger, on that day. Um, and I'm scared to death that I'm going to shank it or hook it or, or hurt somebody out there. So uh, it's, it's overwhelming, um, and it's, uh, of course, it's, a, it's an enormous opportunity for anybody to be nominated for this position. Uh, and I fully recognize w that with that opportunity comes greater obligation. So uh, I, take, I will take it very seriously and try to prepare myself for two weeks from today, which will be the confirmation hearing as best we know right now. Um, so our rock has been uh, for the last 18 months uh, at the center of my universe in so many ways because it, it, really does, uh, it really does capture what the vice chief is expected to do. I call myself the big XO, uh, the heads and beds officer at the highest levels in the Navy, uh, which really means it's, all, it's about readiness and making sure the fleet's getting what it needs, is supported in the building for the things that are important to it and our people. Uh, so, as we all know from uh, last uh, June through August when we had two collisions, uh, two, two years ago in 17 when we had those two collisions, it's really raised a lot of questions about the readiness of our force, the wholeness of our force, the training of our force, the manning of our force, so it came right to the, to the center of my, my universe. And after this comprehensive review by Admiral Davidson and then the subsequent strategic readiness review that the Secretary of the Navy commissioned, uh, we chose to set up this oversight committee, not to be your classic oversight committee, uh, i.e. trying to control everything from Washington, D.C., but to make sure that we were in a position where we could pace the changes that were recommended inside these two documents. And we, oh, by the way, we also wrapped up what, uh, what other organizations, IG organizations and, and those that provide watch for the Navy uh, and conduct investigations to make sure that their recommendations were folded into the CR and the SRR. So in total, there were about 117 recommendations that came forward. Uh, about, uh, we, we eliminated or we reduced by six uh, those that were duplicative in nature. We just kind of went through the curating of all those recommendations. So in essence, we had 111 uh, that we we felt were uh, not only worthy, but important to get after. But if you do all 111 at the same time, you're going to crush the fleet with uh, a lot of actions that, that may make it less safe out there than more safe. So we thought that our job as the Oversight Committee, and, and this committee uh, had several three-star flag officers, senior executives that were part, part of working groups to digest this body of work. Uh, when we sat around a table, it was like, let's make sure we go after the things that are most important first uh, and save the things that can wait till later. Uh, so we tiered them in three basic tiers. Uh, in real simple terms, it's safe operations immediately following the collisions. Those things were executed pretty quickly, even before the RROC stood up. But we wanted to make sure we provided uh, uh, some oversight into how those things were being implemented and whether they were actually working or not. And if they weren't, to provide feedback to the system so that we could go back and, and readdress them. So safe operations was tier one. Tier two was effective operations. So effectiveness, of course, is everything from maintenance to training to manning and those sorts of things. And I can go through a long list of, uh, that fall into that tier two category. It, in fact, it's the vast majority of those recommendations. And then the last tier is what we've described, what I describe as excellence. So you, you move from a, uh, a culture of meeting the minimum standards to taking and raising your standards and becoming uh, a professional outfit that has uh, it, at f the forefront of its mind achieving excellence every single day. And there are several things we looked at from, uh, from culture uh, to uh, just how we communicate or fail to communicate at times. And so 111 recommendations, 91 of them we call implemented today. In other words, we've, we've assigned funding, we've started the build process, we've executed the training, uh, we're doing more training. All of those things are, have been implemented. I call none of it complete because um, I don't think you call anything complete until you've had at least a year or two 
to assess whether the implementation of those measures are working. Uh, and you know, we're, we're a long ways away from uh, knowing whether every single one of those individual recommendations is having the impact that we want on an individual basis. In the aggregate, though, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to read uh, an article in this, this morning's paper from overseas, but uh, Admiral Brad Cooper, who's the commander down at Sasebo, had a really nice article in there about Stars what he's Stripes. seeing in Stars and Stripes, that what he's seeing uh, locally in Sasebo, and I'd encourage all of you to, to read that. I think it's, a, it's an indication that we're on the right path, uh, but it's only one line of bearing, and we need multiple to make sure that we're, we're in the place we need to be. So I'm, uh, I'm encouraged by the progress. Uh, there are aspects of the progress that involve building things like better simulators. Uh, very disappointed when I went out to the fleet um, in almost every location that I went around to. The simulation capability for the surface force was well below what I am used to in the aviation community. And that was my, my baseline uh, understanding of what simulation could do for reps and sets and, and putting people under stressful conditions without putting the platform at risk uh, did not exist in, in the surface community in areas where, where I thought we needed to really accelerate that. So we've accelerated some of that, uh, what we call uh, modified or modernized uh, simulation systems in the fleet, which in essence was just to, from the lessons we learned from Fitzgerald and McCain, was the, was the poor communication, teamwork between, between the bridge and CIC. So we bolted on CIC, uh, simulation to the existing bridge simulators that are in the fleet but and that is helping the helping the instructors teach basic communications but also some skills that are important that we reinforce uh, unfortunately though we don't have the capacity I think the fleet needs to do this as much as I think CEOs would like to do it uh, so we're we have a fully funded uh, plan to build new what we call uh, uh, NSSTs that are integrated, so very modern simulation uh, ca capabilities that are, are, are pretty eye-watering that exist today in, in naval aviation. They exist today in the LCS program. If you've been to an LCS tra trainer, they're remarkable trainers. They're the best in the business. Uh, so we should have that for every ship class in the Navy, or at least be able to reconfigure a simulator to mirror or mimic the ship that you're going to, the ship class you're going to. And uh, so that's fully funded. Uh, it involves building new buildings in both San Diego and Norfolk, large buildings that are gonna house multiple simulators of uh, varying degrees of uh, capability. Uh, and in numbers that allow us to do a lot more reps and sets for our our COs, our department heads, and our sailors in the fleet. That to me will make the biggest difference over time in terms of proficiency, experience, and the kinds of things that we need. Uh, now we like to say in aviation that uh, you gotta have air under your rear end to really understand and appreciate what it is to fly. Um, so you gotta have some seawater underneath your legs if you're really gonna know how to, to operate and command a ship. So simulation is a complement, not a replacement to at sea time. Uh, and, and some of the other steps that Admiral Rich Brown and his team have undertaken on that is to change the career paths for our, our surface warfare officers so they go to sea more often and for greater periods of time so that we're reinforcing the amount of time that they're spending at sea, supplementing it, supplementing it, complementing it with greater simulation capabilities so people get to practice reps and sets before they uh, maybe start a, a higher risk evolution, uh, those sorts of things, uh, which I think will make a difference over the long haul. Those, to pick up on your aviation yeah, yeah, I'm kind of wound up here. No, no, your aviation piece, though. Like when you, go, when you go back as an aviator, you recall, you have the FRS, the replenishment squadron. Did your group discuss a scheme like that for the surface Navy where you have guys in the Pentagon, especially in some of these uh, longer department head or time between department head and exoseal fleet up, getting that, those reps and sets before they get to the ship or at least some recall process. Yeah, absolutely, Pete. The, uh, 
um, you, you, come, you come from your experiences and background, and for every, every career milestone for me, going back to the airplane, we went through the schoolhouse, the fleet replacement squadron, where you had to requal, you had to prove yourself again, you had to understand the, the NATOPS manual, the standardization uh, book that governs how you fly. Uh, we didn't find much of that in the surface community, and, um, and I think the other, if I could close up with the role of the ROC, is to make sure we show and demonstrate and prove that we have sustained commitment to this change. It will be very easy for the institution at the end of 111 recommendations, and we've checked them all off, to put that aside and go focus on something else. We cannot let that happen. So the ROC will continue to stay in place, in perpetuity, uh, until we are, we are, we've convinced ourselves, A, that what we've put in place works, but B, we've shared those lessons learned across all the communities. It's not just the surface warfare lessons learned here, which goes back to your question. For me, aviation went through this yeah. in my early days and before me. We, were, we, we had a pretty poor safety mishap rate. Uh, and then we institutionalized a bunch of things, but I'm not sure we shared that well across the other communities, and they've gone through. The submarine community went through its tough period uh, over a decade ago, and now the surface community has found it. So let's not relearn these lessons over every time we get into it. We need to institutionalize uh, the things we've put in place across every TICOM. Well, thanks. Uh, I think it was a big question. It got a big answer, and I appreciate it. Um, and as far as... Uh, as far as getting back to great power competition, um, my question, next question is, is that it seems like we're stuck on this slow flywheel of readiness, that we're having trouble generating readiness, and if you don't generate readiness, how do you get up to that higher level of performance demanded by great power competition? And so, for example, um, maybe to use an aviation example, I could use a surface example, but just uh, a year, year and a half ago, we had these horrible uh, ready ratings on uh, readiness ratings for Hornets, for mm -hmm. up jets, and uh, some big, some big negative numbers about uh, those that fleet of airplanes. And now there's reports that we've turned it. So I'd like to ask you, why were we there, and what turned it, and how can we use those lessons uh, to get the rest to yeah. come along? Big question, big answer. You ready? <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, the, the readiness of the force is foundational to the operations of the force. You've got to have your readiness right. You've got to fi you've got to be whole in areas uh, that allow our teams to be effective on station. Um, Super Hornet readiness. Uh, Eighteen months ago, as I testified, almost two years ago now, we were we were less than 50% of mission capable rates in the fleet. Uh, and, and in some ways that is similar to what we saw in 7th Fleet through the CRSRR in that we accepted this what was termed uh, norm, uh, normalization of deviance. In other words, we, we allowed our standards to drop thinking we were still okay. Uh, and it's kind of the boiling the frog scenario. Uh, Naval aviation fell into that trap. Uh, naval aviation uh, allowed itself to accept lower rates because it was still meeting schedules and training, but it wasn't meeting mission. So uh, when, we, when we looked at it, it became pretty obvious to all of us in uniform, myself as a former wing commodore who was responsible for generating mission capable rates in the P3 community, um, if we were just to get together and look at this again by ourselves, we'd probably come up with the same answer. Uh, so we went after outside help. We brought in some people from industry. Uh, believe it or not, we went to commercial aviation uh, maintenance repair facilities and talked to people and, and learned how they produce 99.9 something percent of their jets are up on any given day because if you don't have up jets, you don't have customers, you don't fly, all that kind of stuff. So why aren't we looking at ourselves in the same way? And we all know we're not commercial aviation. It's a much more complex thing. But we ought to be doing better than 50%. So 
wasn't long after that uh, where Secretary Mattis came out with his mandate that uh, for the strike fighter community cost all services, were, our goal was to hit 80% mission capable rate by one October of this year. You go to fifth, from 50% to 80% in a huge type model series like the Super Hornet, that's going to take some earth moving. And it took a lot of, a lot of work here. But what, it really, what we really benefited from was learning from folks that were not in our business, shined a light on areas that we hadn't really thought about shining a light on, drove us to look at metrics that we hadn't really focused on in a way that drove the whole team towards a goal. And um, that generated process change, process improvement, awareness, different set of metrics, and um, a kind of an energy and a momentum towards getting up jets. More up jets became, has become the mantra, and it remains so. Uh, and we've been on this journey since about August of last year. And uh, last week, we, we hit 76% uh, up uh, as a running 10-day average. But that, this is like watching your heartbeat, though. It, it, it does this uh, day to day. And you, you know, most of us were sitting around the computer waiting for that next, you know, that next uh, revelation that we just hit a new high, but, uh, and then the very next day we, we drop back down. But what we are seeing is the highs are getting higher and the lows are getting higher. So the overall trend is in a very good position. We're, we're trying to see that exponential improvement, uh, and I think that'll happen. And this is not just by pouring more money into it, more resources. This is about understanding the system, the supply chain from end to end, uh, O-level, operational level maintenance, all the way through deep O-level maintenance. And so those lessons now we're at, we are applying to surface ship maintenance because that is a big um, area of concern in terms of us being able to dig our way out of the backlog of maintenance that exists in the surface fleet and the nuclear uh, the nuclear fleet is also benefiting from these lessons. So this is, this is important, um, and it also gets to how we use our data. Uh, there are terabytes of data that come off an F-18 that, that we do not mine for information. So we are now doing that to try to understand and, whether, and see if we can't start predicting when a, a component of a jet is about to fail as opposed to waiting for it to fail and then fixing it and getting ahead of the curve. So that's, those, are, those sorts of things are really starting to pay off in our, in our insights into how to improve readiness. Is this data thing about readiness or is it also about war fighting or both? Yeah, data, data uh, we're gonna continue to talk a lot about digitizing the Navy. Uh, we, are, we are an analog system in a digital world and we need to, we need to change. Um, I, I see kind of three bins when I see digital for the Navy. One is just business processes, auditability, financials, all of those things should be digitized in a way that get information to leaders at every, and managers at every level uh, near real time uh, and be able to apply uh, algorithms to be more predictive about what direction you're headed in, the trends you're seeing. So business systems. The next one I would say is the readiness. We just talked about that. But the real important aspect of digital is on the operational side. Uh, digitally connecting our sensors, our weapons, our platforms, our people, our command and control at machine speed in order to get inside an adversary's OODA loop so that we can deliver ordnance or effects, whatever they may be, uh, before the adversary uh, provides them to us. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on here in networks, sensors, platforms, and command and control across the Navy, uh, but it's loosely affiliated. It's not tightly governed. Uh, so we're, gonna, we're, we're looking at uh, organizing in a way to provide that governance. Again, same philosophy though, govern, but don't control. Uh, one thing about digital is it's, it opens up opportunities to innovate in ways we never imagined. So if we start to control it too much, uh, the innovation will not go where we want it to go. So uh, we're going to navigate that pretty closely. Got it. Um, shifting gears, but another uh, piece on getting to the high end. Uh, we've noticed that uh, in this FY19 request, or excuse me, the FY20 request, is that uh, the Navy asked for 5,100 more in strength. And that was on top of the 19 requests, so that brought us up to 
if if it's appropriated and uh, approved, three hundred and forty thousand plus in strength. And it wasn't that long ago we were at three twenty two, three twenty six, three twenty eight. Of course, you're mildly aware of this, but what what has been kind of a bugaboo for the Navy has been that there's this persistent gap between budgeted end strength and end strength that you're actually executing and uh, and we've we've had gaps at sea and that was a, a component of the, the CR and the SRR that was highlighted um, you know we always used to talk about this if we have enough people in the Navy they should be on ships and in aircraft squadrons and submarines etc where do we stand in getting to this uh, to this, are we still seeing cross decks out there? Yeah, uh, we're, we're always going to see cross decks in a fleet, Pete. Um, you just there are aspects of manning a ship or a submarine or a squadron that uh, you can't help when somebody gets hurt on a basketball court or some other issue comes up. The unplanned it, loss. The unplanned loss piece. So that that drives uh, the majority of our uh, of our gaps at sea. Um, Nobody likes to be taken off one ship and put on another ship, especially if they they found a nice you know a, a nice place where they're doing well. Um, but the fact that they're doing well is also an attractive reason to put them over on a ship that's doing less well and needs some needs some expertise. Uh, but do we have but, the baseline right? I mean, I, I get your point yeah. that you're going to have unplanned losses off a baseline, but is the is the base right? Yeah, we, the baseline is right. We are executing our. Uh, to our end strength. Um, it's, it's been a very interesting year. The lowest unemployment rate uh, we've seen since 1969, okay? Lowest unemployment rate, uh, uh, low unemployment rates are the biggest enemy to retaining and attracting, recruiting a military force, a volunteer military force. And yet, we met mission last year at the highest mission we've had in over a decade, 40,000 sailors. We met mission in May of last year. So we didn't struggle to get across the finish line. We were able to achieve that, uh, bringing that number in. Um, if, again, the article from uh, this morning, Brad Cooper said, zone A retention in Sasebo this year was 80%. Now there's a lot of Naval Marine officers out in the audience. Can you think back to a time you ever had 80% zone A retention rates. Pretty rare. Across the fleet, we're at 67% zone A retention today, the highest we've had in 10 years. Zone B and zone C are also the highest we've ever had. So what's going on here? If, well, if the classic big force that drives, it, drives uh, retention rates down and recruiting that much harder, why is it that we're seeing almost the reverse? Um, we, we don't have enough data yet to be able to be very accurate with it, but we believe it's because of the changes that Bob Burke and his team have made at N1 that are opening up opportunities, uh, more flexible options, more transparency in the process. People feel like they have a vote a lot earlier on. Fixing PCS, which has been a really hard problem for families over the years. Those things make you feel good about what you're doing. The other part is, do they feel like they've got a purpose and a mission? And I think uh, when Secretary Mattis came in, he talked about great power competition. He talked about being more lethal. He talked about war fighting. Uh, we fully embrace that in the Navy and believe that the national defense strategy is a pretty good description of a maritime century. So we feel like we're trying to get, we are conveying that to our sailors they have the purpose, they, they're being treated well, the majority of them, and, and of course now we're starting to see uh, the retention and the recruitment that, that comes with it. That said, it's a fickle world out there and uh, that could change overnight and we're not taking our eye off that. We're using incentives like we've always used, just a little smarter, and this is where good data can help you be more precise in how you use those compensation measures. All of that combined, I think, makes us a little bit, uh, a little bit sharper in how we uh, go after this. So, are, do we still have gaps at sea? Yeah, we're down to about 6,100 right now. Mm -hmm. uh, when you spread that across a force of 289, 290 ships, um, that's a pretty, that's a very small percentage. 
uh, and it's what we would consider within the tolerances of the friction accounts that come with all of those unplanned losses we talked about. Got it. So pretty good, pretty good shape, but uh, we're on a ramp to recover here. Um, just to follow on to that, one of the things that was always a, um, was another tough piece of this was not just getting the body there, but getting the right uh, fill, fit and fill. Right. And uh, the NEC, the training. Um, how, I mean, you've been, you were a pioneer on this uh, Sailor 2025, and then we have the, uh, you know, the ready, relevant learning component of that. Are we doing better to get the trained, not just the body there, but the trained body there? Yeah, we have our first rate rating, the OS rating, starting their uh, piloting effort on uh, this week. Mm. Uh, just happens to be this week, and that's, uh, that's an important milestone for the ready, relevant learning transformation that we're in. Uh, in very simple terms, Ready, relevant learning is right training, right time, right sailor. Uh, it, it sounds so simple, but it's not the way we've done business for decades in the Navy. It's more been an industrial model, conveyor belt model, hang on for the ride and you'll get your training and whether it really meets your specific needs or not, are not really relevant. Uh, ready, relevant learning is different. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge undertaking when you consider almost 90 different ratings are gone through this, but we have, I, I see Rick Breckenridge in the audience and he, he and I lived this together in, uh, uh, back when he was in N9 and in Fleet Forces. There is, there is uh, we have fully transitioned all the ratings now, Rick, to uh, block learning, first, first series, so that's good. Uh, but now we're into the uh, curriculum development and the training systems to accompany that so that we improve the training in a in a live virtual constructive way so I'm excited about it we're it's a 10-year program because of yeah. the number of rates Long and, we, and again we want to pace the fleet so that we don't throw this all at them at once and uh, they can absorb it thanks um, shifting a little bit uh, another thing that's been in the news lately because you've already cited a couple of them has been the uh, major investments in the unmanned uh, surface and subsurface systems. And uh, several, there's a couple of important items in the PREZ budget for that. And uh, I was just gonna ask you if you could tell us a little bit about how is the Navy determining those requirements? Are they being war-gamed? And what does this mean, you know, kind of an extra credit thing to me is, how, what does that mean to the industrial base if we buy a bunch of small unmanned ships and, uh, and how do we count these in the, the force structure? Yeah. And how, when, what do they, they So you, you promised you wouldn't get me out in front of my skis and you just teed me up to uh -oh. get out in front of my skis a little bit. Um, I mean, the so, CNO and the Secretary have testified to this uh, in both their posture hearings so far. So I think the, uh, what, what they have put out is in accordance with the delivering on the president's budget. Uh, and, and that's pretty much how, how I'll answer that right now because, uh, I mean, I think the, the overall effort here to get to unmanned is intuitively obvious to most of us that you, in order to fight under a distributed maritime operations concept, which is basically to take the team and spread it out a little further on the court mm -hmm. uh, so that we can throw three pointers from behind the arc really well, uh, we're going to need some capability that can get out there in areas that are higher risk. And unmanned is a, is a method to doing that, whether you're talking undersea, on the sea, and clearly unmanned aviation has been in work for a long time, but not in a contested environment. And that's where we're really starting to throw our weight on the aviation side as to how do we operate in a contested environment. Actually, all three uh, domains. So that's the effort that's underway. Uh, the requirements will be developed as we experiment. These are all R&D. Uh, purchases in the budget right. so that we we can get out there and experiment and test these things. I mean, when you think about at sea f operating an unmanned system, much like in the early days of aviation, FAA, you know, they wanted to know how we were going to do collision avoidance. All of those things apply on the sea as well, and we have to work through that. So we're going to have to test and operate and experiment with these things. So you mentioned unmanned aviation. And there's been a lot of focus on uh, carriers uh, in the budget for various reasons. But what about the air wing? I mean, you've got the, uh, these, these uh, I think the biggest selling point of the carriers, among many, is their longevity and that the return on investment is over 50, 
plus years. Um, but the air wing is, has a different cycle of life, if you will. So could you just tell us a little bit about those efforts like FAXX and uh, MQ-25, which you kind of alluded to a minute ago? Yeah, well, MQ-25 is program record. We're going to try to IOC MQ-25 in 2024, if not sooner. I mean, it pushes to be there faster than that. Uh, but we're working, we're working through that. Uh, that is basically Sunoco in the sky for our air wing, which will uh, instantly um, put more Super Hornets back to the air wing to fight with instead of to tank with. That's a really important effort. And plus it can extend the range of the air wing because it can loiter for long periods of time and give gas. Uh, the, the, the next generation air dominance uh, AOA, I think, is uh, due out in, in the next month or two. Uh, that'll inform a lot about cost um, and, and capacity and, and capability that, that we'll look at. Uh, we've been doing this research and analysis for a better part of a decade. Uh, it's not something that has just emerged. Uh, when I was in N98 a while ago, uh, this was, uh, we, we began to construct how we would do the AOA back then. We knew we had gaps that we were gonna have to fill in the out years beyond the service life of the uh, Super Hornet. So uh, what we decided back then and what we're committed to now is that NJAD is not a platform for platform replacement, it's a capability replacement. Uh, so we're, we're not defining NJAD as a thing, uh, as in another airplane, it might be, uh, but it might be a series of things that contribute to an effective uh, uh, capability f from the carrier that can operate forward. So uh, very interested to see what the AOA says, and, and then we'll take it from there. But a uh, lot, of, lot of effort going into this. Great. Well, I'll, uh, thank you, and I'd like to open it up for questions. And I just ask that people stand up, identify yourselves, and ask a question. Uh, gentleman right here. My, my name is uh, Sang Min I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. I have a question about uh, North Korea. Uh, U.S. Navy and Coast Guard has been doing the mission to track down the illicit ship-to-ship -ship transfer in East China Sea. So I want to know until now how many um, the evidence of illicit shipping U.S. Navy Coast Guard has found and then how to assess that operation. Yeah, I'm, we are heavily involved in, the, in identifying when ship-to-ship -ship transfers are occurring. Uh, I can't give you a, a, a number, um, but I can tell you the operations are ongoing and they'll continue to be ongoing as part of a uh, multi-national national approach to it uh, and sharing that information across diplomatically. It, it goes from us to the diplomatic community uh, to try to convince others to join in any effort. Uh, thanks. How about over here? Hi, good morning. Ben Warner of U.S. Naval Institute News. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about retention again. Um, I know you've been able to meet your targets, and that's, that's great. But um, one of the things that's curious is uh, the diversity of the force that you're retaining. And um, specifically, if you, just as an example, last week the 06 slate came out. Um, and, and this is my, my count is there's about 373 officers that are promoting the 06, but only about 8% total are female, which seems kind of like there's a disconnect, you know, because you, know, you have a lot more at the lower ranks, but they're just not, um, for whatever reason, they're not making it to that senior leadership. And I was just wondering if you could talk about some of the things that you think are going on and, you know, things that are going on to try and address that. Yeah, Ben, a great question. Uh, Right now we're assessing, my, my numbers will be a little dated because I'm a little dated from my previous job, but uh, the numbers are on the order of about a quarter of our accessions in the, in the officer community are female today. Naval Academy class last year and this year the highest on record in the high 20s, that, and they continue to climb. So finding highly qualified, talented women who want to serve is not the issue. The issue is, is making the service in the Navy um, compatible with some of their other desires as they, as they, uh, they move on in their careers. 
they're similar to the same issues that uh, a lot, uh, many men have when it comes to family separation uh, and those sorts of things. So we've, all of the changes we've made in the personnel policy world in the last four or five years, plus uh, if you look at the DOTMA changes that have come through, Congress has granted to us, uh, many of those started with the United States Navy's request to make those changes. And they've been very good to us in terms of providing more flexibility in how we manage careers. All of that is just is recent. So uh, we have to take the long view here to see if we can st start retaining women at a higher rate because until they retain at the same percentage at each one of those milestones, you're, you're gonna have a, few, a smaller number to select from uh, when they get to the 05, 06 and above ranks. And I think that's what we're seeing in, um, in the 06 promotion rates at 6%, 7%, 8%. It needs to be higher than that. But you've got to build the base, and the base has to stay with, with the team long enough to be in a position to promote at those higher rates. I think we're doing the right things, uh, but only three, four years into it, in many cases less time than that, is not enough time to see what adjustments we need to make even to the, the DOTMA changes that have been authorized. Right, thanks for the question. How about right here? We'll get you a mic. It's coming up. Hi, sir. Um, my name's Angelita. I'm a writer and blogger. Um, from what I gather is that Secretary Mattis had a vision for the military. And my concern is always that vision because it sounds like Putin and Xi have their own plan for the military. My question is about the space program. <clears throat> I mean, from what I've been reading, Parts of the military have not been very open to it, and even the Congress have not been very open to it. But if you look at China, I mean, their Navy is kind of like coordinating now with their space programs. And then with Russia, there's the Arctic bases, which far exceeds what the US have. They have 40, they have one and a half. CSI has had that video. So I just want to know what your actual plans with regards to the competitive powers. Yeah. Thank you. Tough question to answer right now. I would tell you that uh, the Navy fully realizes, appreciates, and operates in space today. Uh, and, and all of the Joint Force understands just how important space is to future operating capability, current and future operating capability. The debate has been a around organizations and organizing to make sure that we can deliver on a capability that allows us to win in combat. Uh, that's playing out. It's very clear where the president's budget has taken it, and, um, and we're in the middle of testifying, and Congress has to decide how it wants to uh, support the military and, and organizing to be able to fight in space. Russia uh, I, I didn't hear that part of the question. So uh, Ar Arctic is very important to us. And, uh, Or yeah. Are we kind of where we are right now? Well, bases are less important than presence to me. I, mean, I think we have to make sure that we can provide the presence that would be required to make sure people understand um, that it is important to the United States. But this is the classic case of do you have a Navy that's sized right to do all the things that we're being asked to do? And I think that's been a fundamental uh, discussion we've had for the last several years. Okay. Um, a gentleman in the red, there, orange or red, right there. You got a mic. Yes, my name's Harold Pavel. I'm a private citizen, U.S. Navy retired. I have one, uh, one question. Uh, has the Navy developed an answer to the DF-21D ballistic missile? Uh, nothing I could tell you in this classification level would be satisfying. Um, okay, how about this gentleman right here? Morning, I'm Scott Massioni with Federal News Network. Yeah. Uh, in your first uh, 
sort of question that you, you answered. You talked a lot about simulations um, and, and how you're investing in, in expanding the capacity. The Air Force right now has something called pilot training next, maintainer next, which are sort of um, futuristic ways of training. They're kind of looking at data analytics and all that kind of stuff. Is the Navy investing in anything uh, that would kind of help with, with the, the R&D type side of, uh, of training in, in the 2020 budget? Uh, yes, in a big way, Scott. Um, so I would say data analytics, data analysis uh, is central to the architecture that we're trying to construct with, with, uh, with not only with ready relevant learning, but even more than that into live virtual constructive, which uh, I, I had the privilege of being on Lincoln a few weeks ago during our Com 2 x uh, And this was the, probably the most substantial, most challenging Com 2 x I've ever witnessed. And it was made possible by live virtual constructive capability on that strike group. Uh, it's a remarkable technology. It's one we're f heavily invested in. We're getting a lot of help from industry. Uh, we've got a great systems command down in, uh, down in Orlando called NOC TSD. I'd invite you to go visit them and talk to them and see what we're doing. It's, uh, it's remarkable. And, and, it's, and it's a game changer for training at the, at the strike group and fleet combined levels. Even across coast is where we're trying to get to so we can we can exercise together with strike groups on in either ocean um, in a live and virtual way. It's, uh, I think, guys like Rick Breckenridge and others who have really championed this through the years because it's, it's delivering now that in a way that makes a big difference for us. Okay. How about this gentleman over here on the side? We'll get you a mic. Morning, Admiral Gene Rosetti. A question going back to what you started with, with the uh, the simulators. That's all certainly very Im important. But is somewhere in your in the plan uh, to allow the COs and XOs out at sea a little bit of time to really determine what their ship needs in their opinion, and maybe get a little, give them a little time to figure it out and do it. Yeah, Gene, it's uh, probably one of the key tenets of, uh, of what we learned from the comprehensive review and the strategic readiness review, is COs need more time to train their crews. Free play time, not you know, constructed time. Uh, you need that, but you also need time for that CO to just get underway uh, and be able to test and assess his or her crew. And I think, uh, how do you do that? Well, you get maintenance under control, Number one, number two, you get scheduling under control so that we don't over schedule uh, and operate those ships, give them more time to do their, their training. Uh, in FDNF, Japan, that model, was, that model really wasn't in, in place. It is now under what we call OFRPJ, so it's a similar construct to what, we're, what we have here in the States where there is dedicated time to training in both basic um, and intermediate and advanced phases. Uh, we've applied that model to FDNFJ. It's a little bit shorter, tighter, but the maintenance challenges out there are different. So uh, those efforts are starting to show some benefit. Uh, we've also reduced the number of inspections. Um, any SWOs in the room uh, will uh, remember ICAVs uh, with great pleasure. Uh, we've, we've knocked out about 60 some different inspections inside the ICAP process to free up some time. A lot of them were repetitive, done by uh, overlapping groups of inspectors that did not always see the inspection the same way. It really wasn't uh, as helpful as it could be. Rich Brown and his team uh, took a really a zero based review on the entire ICAP process and the inspection process to try to open up time for CEOs to have more uh, free play, if you will, with their crews. So it is a tenant for moving forward, and we're going to continue to assess it to make sure we're seeing the benefit of that. Thank you, Good Admiral. Question. Okay. How about this uh, gentleman right here? In, uh... Good morning. Mark Fidelli, Booz Allen, Hamilton. Hey, How are you? Good. Congratulations on the nomination. Thank Excited. You. Um, question about the industrial base and modernization. You mentioned unmanned, you mentioned digital. Do you have 
comments to make at this time or any thoughts on commercial technology, things like the DIACs and OTAs have proven that DOD can purchase commercial technologies and innovate and start to move faster, quicker, maybe move towards readiness goals with commercial technology, yet the industrial base, we all have to pivot to that. Do you have any comments on how to thread yeah. the needle there, sir? Yeah, um, I, I'm maybe not as schooled as I should be on the commercial side, but it, w let me give you an example. One I just saw two weeks ago in Dahlgren, Virginia, which is uh, where our Aegis engineers uh, are, are operating and trying to make improvements to that system. They recently just completed building a digital twin of the Aegis platform. So today on a DDG, there's 12 large racks of computers that operate the Aegis weapon system. Uh, they were able to put the twin in a box about this big, and they're working to get it down to just one, uh, what, what do we call them? I don't even know what they call those things, computers. Um, it's, <laughs> But it, what's, hap what's happened there is it allows, it allows us to put a digital twin on an existing ship, operate in a DevOps development operations environment real time at sea, operating the Aegis weapon system, separate from the actual 12 racks of certified gear, and, um, and see if we can, in, in, in a case we had just a few weeks ago, can we hit a target with a live weapon, a live target, live weapon with the digital twin? First time didn't go right. But within, within 24 hours, because it's a DevOps environment, the software engineers were able to make the appropriate changes next day, hit the target. For those of you just guys in the room, uh, how long do you think that would have taken under normal circumstances? Man, yeah, six months is generous. So this is, this is the remarkable change that occurs when you can digitize platforms. Uh, it also allows you to take almost any Aegis platform and turn it into a baseline nine using the virtual twin. So you can, we are starting to see the real benefit of going digital here uh, in a development operations world. Vice Chief, I, I have a follow on question on the training piece too is, uh, you know, one of the books that uh, CNO Richardson recommended to the flag community was uh, Learning War by Trent Home. Yeah. Um, so we're proud that's a Naval Institute book, but the thing that he latched onto was that the critical thinking that a lot of people think we won the war because we had better ships, better airplanes, we outproduced the Japanese, and in many respects those statements are true, but that the critical thing was that we had people who knew how to fight and do adapt and change under strenuous combat conditions. And uh, so it's that war fighting edge. In your efforts uh, with the CR and the SRR, has that come up that we need to identify, almost like the special operators are doing, that there's people and attributes of people who are not playing, they're playing to win. There's a person, there's a personality type that plays to win, mm -hmm. not just to avoid losing. And you could have all those other things we've talked about so far today, but without that, you may not have it, what you need to win. Has, there, has any of that come up in the, uh, in the mix? Yeah, maybe not directly in the uh, ROC, but Admiral Richardson has certainly inculcated this notion of uh, learning in, a, in, in a high velocity learning in a way that the Navy hadn't thought about in a long, long time. Trent's book captures that very well uh, in the pre-war years and uh, if it's done anything for me, it's, it's to understand and appreciate the value of wargaming in uh, places like Navy War College, National War College, and all of our other institutions. We're gonna upgun ourselves on wargaming in the okay. future because uh, uh, you can't just give it to a very small group of folks in a war college class and expect that you're gonna have it to proliferate across the Navy. This is where we're gonna see who's got what it takes to, to, uh, to make decisions in an environment where you're under stress. You, you, need, to, you need to be making choices uh, with the pressure of time and, and that component as part of your decision-making process. So I think wargaming is, is vital to this. It's been addressed in the, uh, in the education for strategy discussion uh, and the report that came out of the Secretary's office, the folks in here that were part of that. 
that's been a very, very helpful uh, blueprint for how to move this effort forward to get at what you're, you're suggesting. So work gaming won't be just the domain of senior people, it'll be pushed down further and both. test people. It's got to be both. Uh, I think our fleet commanders need to do this more. Uh, I've got to do it more. Uh, if you're really going to understand and appreciate the capabilities and the con-ops that you're developing for the future, you got to see them tested, you got to see them, uh, and there's got to be an experimentation loop that goes with that out in the fleet experimentation world. Thank you. I've got time for one more question. How about right there with, and gets Jerry Roncalato there. Hi, Jerry. Admiral, good to see you. Congratulations. You. Uh, my question deals with taking the, the next step in terms of the things you've talked about with trainers, wargaming, uh, digital twins, both HMNE side and Aegis side. The technology now exists to get that, those capabilities into very small platforms like a Surface Pro tablet uh, and get that to every sailor. A lot of what we've talked about or, or discussed today talks about shore-based trainers I'd like uh, your thoughts on what we might be able to do with new technology to get the sets and reps capability out to sea so the crews can use it, give the COs tools to help them train more efficiently. Uh, Jerry, I think that's um, vital I I moving forward from here. Uh, there's a lot of good ideas that, that are emerging from the fleet on this front. Some of our TICOMs and our resource sponsors in the building are ahead of, are, are ahead of uh, your question and moving out in that direction. But this, this virtualization capability from digital is, is the enabler. So uh, the long pole in that tent is to get the data right. And, and that's not a, an insignificant effort. As we have all learned, as you try to digitize something, it comes back down to the data. And you have to get it right, and then you have to make sure that data vulnerabilities there that we have to address in cybersecurity and other places. So. Um, uh, what, you, what you're describing, the submarine community does really, really well already. Naval aviation in places does really, really well already. Live virtual constructive that I talked about early is part of that evolution already. So now we're just talking about, uh, I used to call it, give me a, what was the, what was the platform on uh, Star Wars where you could get inside and... and holodeck. A holodeck. I said, we need a holodeck for our ships. You know, get a Connex box, you can load it off the, uh, off the pier onto the ship when they get underway and go on deployment. And in that holodeck box, you could go in as, a, as an engine man, as a, as a STG, you name it, and swipe your ID card in it would, here emerges your, your work center, your workspace, and you can start training, doing reps and sets real time. Okay, that, that's probably a vision a little too far. But... I tell you, the way things are moving, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think we might be able to uh, see something like that, even on the workstation on the ship today, that you can turn into a training, you know, with a flip of a switch, you're in the training mode, and you're getting real-time real data, and you're getting uh, injected data that allows you to look at threats and, and react. So definitely on our, on our blueprint for the future. Well, on behalf of uh, CSIS, and the Naval Institute, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Huntington Ingalls, but most importantly, thank the Vice Chief for making time. We know your time is precious, especially right now. Thank you for this time, and Thanks, we Pete. truly appreciate it. Let's thank give you, him a hand. Thank you. Yeah. thank you very much, and good luck. Yeah.